We're pleased to have so many students from so many different schools here tonight, and we got a lot of info to share, but before we do, I'm gonna have our president, uh, Tara, say a few words. Thanks, John. Um, welcome to Kendall. It's exciting to have so many faces here that, uh, that we don't get to interact with on our <laughs> any kind of regular basis. And shout out to you for being involved. I understand there's 10 schools participating this year in the MOS Challenge, is that right? Uh, little healthy competition, that's good, right? But you're building your network, and the future of industry is right here in this room. Get to know each other. Healthy competition's great. Friendly competition, even better. Um, so best of luck, um, and again, we're excited to have you here. Thanks. So what we're looking for is actually a little healthy collaboration. Um, so let's talk about the schools. Yeah. So tonight's going to be largely informational. We're going to have a little bit of interaction with the students. Hope, hopefully you showed up, maybe prepared to share an idea. Who's, who's got an idea that they think they might want to talk about tonight and possibly get some feedback? And I'm going to coax a lot more of you into doing that. So get comfortable. You got about 15 minutes before I really start putting the pressure on you. So um, drink a little more of the sparkling punch, loosen up a little bit. So we've got 10 schools that are participating this year as partners in the MWest Challenge. Uh, we are actually, I believe, the largest uh, collaborative competition for, for a business student venture competition in Michigan. Um, this is actually our sixth year, I believe. I don't know if someone can back me up on that, but I think it's a sixth year. And we've got a couple of really great sponsors that also help us with some funding and facilitation for the event, Spectrum Health Innovations, the Grand Angels, and then Michigan State Center for Innovation. So. Um, real quick, let's just do this fast. Who's from Grand Valley? All right, who's from Calvin? Nobody yet. There you go, one. Way to represent. Cornerstone, Davenport, Ferris, Kendall, Kuiper, Aquinas, Hope, GRCC. So hopefully you look around the room and you see a bunch of faces that you don't know. Uh, that's one of the main reasons that we do this event, so you can meet some new people, right? You probably see the same people walking around the halls in your classes almost every day. Uh, this is a great opportunity to meet new people and meet people that don't think like you. So here's what we've got on, on tap for tonight. Uh, we're gonna go through a little bit of an explanation of what the MWest Challenge is. We're gonna do some 30 second pitches and give you an opportunity to share your ideas, get some feedback, maybe find people that have similar interests or similar ideas that you could join up with. A um, Little bit of networking, and then we're gonna cover a few basics of what is a business model, how do you validate a business model, how do you pitch an idea, things like that. So. Um, by show of hands, how many people in here are from a business program? So maybe about half. So hopefully this isn't too boring. Um, it's always a challenge. Some of you are a little bit more advanced and some of you actually have a startup already or have been through similar things. Um, I'm gonna move really quickly through this, but I wanna touch on some of the basics. So those of you that have not, get a little bit more than just, hey, here's a competition, sign up over here, right? And then after the event, anyone who gave us their email address, we'll send this out. So don't worry about taking notes or anything. We'll send it out and you can, uh, you can revisit that and get all the detail you want. So what is the MWest Challenge? Uh, before we get to that point, I wanna talk a little bit more about why we do this. And more specifically, why entrepreneurship? So how many people in here feel like they are an entrepreneur already? How many people think they're gonna graduate and start a business? Okay, how many of you think it's important to understand what an entrepreneur thinks like? Good, so that's what this is really all about for us. And I'm gonna show you just a couple of words here. Um, you can find all kinds of examples of this and, and companies love to talk about this now, but I love this quote that companies are looking to hire people with entrepreneurship in their DNA. So this isn't looking for people to start a business for me. This isn't I'm looking for a business person that thinks like an entrepreneur. This is I'm looking for employees that think entrepreneurially. Right? And what that means is you think around ideas, you gather a lot more details, you think much more broadly about the ideas that you're proposing to your business and what it takes to actually implement them. So this is important. 
This competition is not about having as many students start as many businesses as they possibly can. This competition is about people understanding what it feels like to start an idea. So our goal is to help students learn the basics of business modeling, experience entrepreneurship in a very low risk environment, learn from peers and mentors, connect with community, feel ownership and passion for an idea they have, and learn how to start, and that's important, right? Simon Sinek said this, dream big, start small, but most of all, just start. And you'd be surprised at how many entrepreneurs I meet that have awesome ideas, and I say, well, what'd you do about it? Well, nothing, I don't know what to do yet, or I'm, I'm, I don't have the money, or you know, I'm worried about talking about my idea. There's a lot of excuses as to why you wouldn't start doing something, but it's really easy to just start, and from there, things grow, and you know whether it should continue or not the further down the path you get. So this is all about starting something. So the M West experience combines a few elements of things like Startup Weekend. Who's been to a Startup Weekend? That's a great event. There's one at the end of this month, uh, February 28th and 29th, I believe, at Start Garden. Um, there will be student fees um, that'll be significantly reduced, so that's a good thing to go to. But start, uh, Startup Weekend's about finding a team and learning how to work collaboratively, right? Startup Experience. So this is a, an organization that offers all kind of workshops and incubator type programming and things. And it's really about hands-on learning and learning how to build an idea um, kind of in the context of learning what it means to develop a business model. And then how many people have been to a five by five? So five by five is like a local pitch event. They give, they have five people present, they give $5,000 to the winner. That's about the scale of what we're doing. And the pitch competition is all local folks that show up. It's a very low stress environment. Um, and that's kind of what we're about, giving you an opportunity to develop ideas, get in front of the community and your peers and pitch, and try to win a little bit of money. So the experience includes building um, a dynamic team potentially, creating a product or service solution that you can kind of dig into the details, development all the elements around your business model, gathering feedback, increasing your confidence around ideas, and then pitching to a panel of professionals. So I want to talk about teams for a minute. So first of all, building a team is not required, right? But let's talk about why teams are important in entrepreneurship. How many people have ever worked at a business before? Hopefully everybody can raise their hand, right? What does it take to successfully run a business? How many disciplines are there? All kinds, right? Designers, operations people, marketing, finance, accounting. So if that's what it takes to run a successful business, if you're gonna create an idea for a business, doesn't it make sense to kind of have that perspective present when you do that, right? It makes a lot of sense. So take a look at these guys. Let's, let's like show some age here. Who knows who these people are? Somebody please tell me. What's that? Steve Jobs, right? So they started Apple, right? Steve, Ron, and Steve. So these guys, before they started Apple, these are the three founders, Ron actually bought out way too soon. I think he got paid something like $1,000 or he to basically sell out his shares of the company. Huge mistake. Um, before they started Apple, this is who they were, right? Steve Jobs was basically a, a tech school dropout, right? Really more of a salesperson at heart. He was passionate about the idea. The other two guys were engineers, programmers, techie type people. They weren't entrepreneurs, they weren't business people, but they had an idea that they believed in. And they took it quite far, right? If you read the history about these guys, they developed the product that they wanted to sell. Um, they got a few people to buy it. They got a retail store. But, but it still wasn't quite a business yet. It was missing something. Who knows who this guy is? Nobody ever does. This is the most important person in the history of Apple, right? Tim, you know who this is? This is their first investor. This is the guy that said, this is important. What you guys are doing is gonna mean something and we're gonna pour some gas in the fire, right? I'm gonna teach you how to make a business out of your idea. And this is a, a great story that really demonstrates the idea that 
you don't have to be a business person to start an idea, but the more well-rounded you make that team and the more advice and advisors and people that you get involved, the higher your chances are for success. This guy wrote the first check. Um, he hired their first CEO, he hired their first CFO, their first COO, and then later became their second CEO and really took Apple to where it is today before Jobs took over. So investor, advisor, somebody with a lot of experience. He worked at Intel for a number of years before this. The point being, you had a bunch of creatives, a bunch of techie people that had a good idea. You start mixing in a few other disciplines and it can really grow from there. So why build a team? You get a nice well-rounded perspective, speed up a lot of decision making, expand creative thinking, more capacity to do, and support and energy, right? And the one thing I always tell uh, startups is, if you're gonna build a team, Make sure you build a team of people that you can get in trouble with, right? People that you're gonna have fun with, that all bring something a little bit different, but kind of work together. So, are teams required? No. You can do this by yourself if you want, but we just highly recommend for the experience that, that you try it. Work with another person, another, you know, somebody that isn't exactly like you, and see what you can do with the idea. Uh, three is kind of the magic number. Three is a great team. You get a nice balance. Everybody has opportunity to contribute and participate and add to the conversation without uh, kind of falling through the cracks, which happens with bigger teams. So back to what is the MWest challenge? So we have 10 schools participating. It's a student venture competition for entrepreneurial minded folks like yourself, exploring new ideas as a business, a pitch competition and networking. And we've got about 12,000 uh, plus in prizes for the competition day. Um, so, who can compete? Well, any independent venture in kind of the startup stage. And I would say, unless you have a business right now that's already functioning, you fall into this category. Um, majority owned by students. Um, it can be a profit or a nonprofit um, type of a business. If you do have something that you're doing, a maximum of 500,000 or 5,000 in sales, investments, grants, and students that are enrolled in any one of the 10 schools for the spring, undergrad, or grad. So it's pretty broad. So who, who doesn't fall into that? Well, if you won last year first place, you're disqualified, right? We wanna make sure that we give more businesses and people an opportunity to participate. Any businesses, any businesses with sales over 5,000, if you were incorporated before April 1st of last year, um, any corporate sponsored projects or tech transfer type projects where a big corporation has done most of the development around your, your idea, and then international students can participate. They just can't be um, one of the principal founders because we have a problem writing a check to them as an institution. So we wanna level the playing field, make it accessible and easy for anyone with a new idea to compete, um, encourage lots of new ideas, and build that competitive spirit. So let's talk about confidentiality and IP. This is, this is a public event and the final competition is public. What that means is anybody could walk in and see what you're doing, right? It's not private. So the judges and mentors are not gonna be asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. That means that they could see it and they could talk to somebody else about what you just shared with them, right? Um, you be selective about what you disclose, but, and you can try to put confidential and pr proprietary, uh, proprietary on your material to deter that, but it is open to the public and you have to be aware of that. So I always get these kind of looks like, well, I'm a little bit nervous. Should I share my, my golden goose, right? Should I talk about it a little bit? Um, I will tell you personally, from my experiences, turning a, an idea into a business is extremely hard, especially by yourself. What you have here is an opportunity to get a lot of feedback and work with people, gather a lot of different perspectives, and that's a significant advantage. So I would err more on the side of sharing and getting feedback versus holding things tight to your chest, right? Um, so where can ideas come from? Well, you might already have the idea. Maybe you thought of it last semester in a class, something like that, and that's fine. Um, you might hear a pitch tonight and say, I really like this idea and, and approach whoever presented the idea and ask them to work with them. That's fine too. Um, you might think of something right now, right? I'm gonna put so much pressure on you guys to pitch in a few minutes that the first thing's gonna pop to your head and you're gonna love it, right? So maybe you come up with something right now or you leave here tonight and you start thinking, hey, I've always wanted to work with some folks in my school on something and then you put a team together and then as a team you come up with something you can work on. 
The important thing is it's new. Something new, something that you can put some serious time into thinking about. So what kind of uh, ideas can you work on? Uh, it could be a physical product, it could be a digital product like an app or a website, um, it could be a new technology application of some type, a service business, it could be a B2B or a B2C, um, it could be a profit or a nonprofit type business. There really are no restrictions. And so the next question that people always ask, how far should I take them? Well, it depends on how much time you wanna put in, right? We're not expecting a 10-page business plan. We're not expecting a fully functional prototype. We're not expecting sales, none of that. All we want are really well thought out ideas. Um, so spend the time to think through the business model concept and put together a good pitch or poster. Visualize it in some way or describe it in a way that helps people understand the idea. Maybe validate it with some people that are in your target audience. Um, branding ideas, marketing ideas, and you can build a prototype, but like I said, it's not required. So let's talk about the deliverables real quick. Um, the first thing you're gonna be asked to do is submit an executive summary. So when you apply to be in the competition, the website is live right now. You could sign up and say, I wanna compete, or you can wait until you submit this, but by March 6th, you're gonna be asked to submit an executive summary. And it should include these seven things. You can find these on our website. There are questions that go with each one. All you have to do is answer the questions. And you can submit that in a seven slide PowerPoint or a three page Word document. What we're not looking for is a bunch of narrative fluff, right? We're just, it can be bullet pointed statements. Just give us the information. Fill in what you can. So you could include a couple images if you want, um, save it out as a PDF and upload it by March 6th. So this is your first gateway into the competition. So what if you can't provide all the information? It doesn't matter. Fill out what you can submit it, you'll get some feedback from the mentors, the community mentors that are gonna review and include what feedback you can, keep working on it and then improve your story for the competition. So kind of think of the executive summary as sort of a halfway point, get as much as you can there and then just keep working and when you get feedback, round it out for the final competition. So the executive summaries are gonna be reviewed by three to four independent reviewers from the community. Um, the teams are gonna receive uh, like, a, like an averaged score from all of their reviewers, and they're gonna provide direct um, constructive feedback to you. Think about this, maybe try this, look into this. Things that are gonna help you improve your idea. The scores are gonna be used to determine which teams are placed in which track in the competition. So we have two tracks. Um, the day of the competition, we will have eight finalists who will be able to do a seven minute pitch with three minute Q&A. So this is very much like what I'm doing right now in front of a screen with a full pitch deck. These will be the top eight scores that come from the executive summary. And we have a first, second, third place for that. And then beyond that, there will be 30 teams that will be selected to do a poster pitch type presentation. So this is a 90 second pitch to a jury that will come around to your station and you can use your poster as a prop. Um, there will actually be two flights. So we'll split that group in half and 15 will be randomly selected for A and B. And there'll be a jury that works through each one. And each one of those flights is gonna have a first and second place, right? So even if you don't make the finals, there's a really good chance that you'll make the, uh, the 90 second pitch and each school will be allotted three slots for that. So every school will at least have three teams represented in the, show, the innovation showcase. So all in all, that means we're gonna have 38 teams that make it in the competition from 10 different schools. How many of you have ever been to a business plan competition before? or competed in one. How many teams usually make it into the finals where you win money? 10 maybe? If, if you're lucky, four, right? Our goal is to give out as much money to as many different teams as possible. So we have seven total prizes and I think 12,500 was the last number. We still have sponsors kind of giving money. So it isn't big money, but it's enough to incentivize you guys to think about it. So here's what the competition timeline looks like. We have the kickoff tonight. The website is open and accepting um, registrations. By March 6th, if you wanna compete, midnight, 11.59 actually, that night, you will have to sign up, 
there will be a thing that you express your intent to compete and you will upload your executive summary at that point. By the 18th, you will um, receive feedback from the judges that review. And then by the 23rd, we will send out a notification that um, notifies all the teams where they're placed in the competition. And then by the 13th, so a little, little less than a month later, your final pitch deck and your poster will be, will be due. And the day after the 14th the, is the final competition from 5 to 9 p.m. right up the hill here at the ATC building at GRCC. And uh, you're going to want to go to that because the Culinary Institute is going to be providing all the food and beverages for the event. And if you haven't had food up there before, uh, it's outstanding. Um, on the day of that event, this is what it's going to look like. We'll have from 5 to 6 um, networking. People will be set up with their posters and the showcase. So these will be 30 teams. Lots of folks from the community there outside the schools kind of walking around, talking to you about your ideas, giving you feedback. And then from 6 to 7, the teams will do their 90-second pitch in front of the jury. We'll take a break. And then we'll have a little over an hour for the eight finalists. So what I really love about this event is that even if even if you don't make the finals, you can go and watch and you can see some really good pitch presentations. So um, how many people have seen a really good business pitch presentation? Just a few, right? That's kind of like the secret sauce. That stuff really doesn't come out much. And if you try to Google it, what you're going to find is some old pitch deck that uh, Airbnb gave like 15 years ago. And it's going to be five slides and really tailored toward a venture capital group and totally irrelevant to the way that you would develop an idea right now. So there aren't very many opportunities to see and hear people talk about ideas. This is one of them. So questions. I just hit you with a ton of information. I'm moving through it pretty quick. And you'll get all this, but yes. Um, later. So we're going to do some pitching. And then a little bit later on this evening, I'm going to walk through a couple basics. And I will walk through what should be in your pitch deck. And I'll talk about um, how they're going to score them at that point. Yes. OK, so if you are an international student, let's talk tonight at some point, And I'll be getting into more specifics of that. We just we have to find a way to give someone who is a U.S. citizen money, which gets a little tricky coming from a university. So we'll we'll figure it out. Um, we just have to maybe do a little work around. More questions? No. Okay. So what are we going to do next? We're going to have a little idea pitch here, and not very many people raise their hands, but. More people are going to talk. Uh, so anyone can pitch an idea. doesn't matter if you just came up with it on the spot right here. After you pitch, what we're going to have you do is go to this table. And there's a big Post-it pad and a couple markers. Just kind of write your idea out succinctly on the poster. Go find a wall to put it up on and kind of hang out there. So we'll do this for maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then afterwards, um, anyone who didn't pitch or even anyone who did, can kind of circulate the room, a little bit of networking, grab some more food, something to drink. And what we want you to do is go around and give people feedback on their ideas. Or if you find an idea that you really like and you think you want to maybe work with the person, ask them, hey, I really like what you're doing here. Would you be open to another team member, right? So think about that. This is not about forcing you to build a team. This is not about forcing you to get really in depth with your ideas at this point. But it is a good opportunity to meet new people and potentially get some, some feedback. Um, oops, that's weird. So yeah, 30 seconds. We're going to time them. And what we want you to do is say your name, what school you're from, what your major is, what problem are you solving, and very quickly what the idea is. And if you have any people that you're looking for or team needs or disciplines, you can kind of tack that on there too, right? So any questions about this? I'll give you, I'll give you a couple seconds to think, and then we'll have you come up here and grab the mic. How many people love talking in front of an audience? One, two, everybody else is terrifying, isn't it? One of the best things you can do as a college student is learn how to talk in front of people and learn how to talk about your ideas and not be afraid to say what's on your mind 
and connect with people. If you're here with a couple of people that you're already working with, you can pick one person to come up and talk. Right? So just try to get them to like spread a little bit. There's plenty of markers in here. To... So we'll start in 120 seconds. Time them. In their pitch. Yep. Thanks. Sorry, they asked me for a black slide. So this arrow is not by accident. This is where I want you to stand, right where it's pointing. Yeah. yeah. Would you mind? So we're not going to yank you off with a big cane, but Julie's in the front here, and she's going to kind of, you know, give you the give you the signal when you hit your time. All right. So who's going to be brave and go first? You want to go? All right. I'm always up for going first. Main student All right. Uh, my name is Tyson Vancouvering. I'm from Cornerstone University. Uh, I'm a marketing major. So my problem deals with uh, the rising number of Death by deaths by gun in the United States and mainly with like stolen firearms. Uh, so my idea is like a fingerprint scanner that will like somehow fit and in, incorporate into a firearm so that only the owner of said firearm will be able to use it, thus preventing people to be able to steal a firearm from a homeowner or something like that and then use it against them and kill them. It's a pretty solid idea. He might need some engineers to help out. Maybe a designer. Got a few of those here. Who wants to go next? All right. Can I get the list of things again? Name, school, problem being solved, idea, description, CVs. Okay. Um, my name is Salvation and Kiko. Um, I'm from Cornerstone University. Uh, my major is business administration. And the problem I looked at was Grand Rapids is a college city, pretty much. And we have a lot of students with, without cars or paying for transportation needs. So a ride share app would be my solution, where we can find people in your area that drive to the exact same area as you, same college or college close by that you can share with. Kind of like Uber, but just for college students alone. That's it. It's a good idea. So you probably need an app developer, huh? Unless you do that on the side. So you can see already two very different types of ideas. Don't be afraid to share even if it's half-baked at this point. Who's next? I'm Drew Craven. I'm with Grand Valley State University, and I'm part of the Social Innovation Club here at Grand, or there at Grand Valley, I guess. I'm a mechanical engineer, and we're working on harnessing human energy, just like we work to harness solar, wind, and any other renewable energy types. How we want to do that? We want to make a modular system that's going to be able to attach to any kind of uh, rowing machine or any kind of uh, gym equipment. So we're looking for a lot of feedback, and we're looking for possibly some more engineers. Thank you. Excellent. So just to clarify, this is something a person would use to generate energy that goes back into the system. The human, oh, interesting. Not like matrix style humans generating energy, right? Okay, we'll need some clarification on that one. Who wants to go next? All right. My name is Kayla Lett. I'm also from Grand Valley State University. And a project we're working on is making a mobile makerspace. So we're thinking of a bus that's centered around innovation to provide a space for students and faculty to have a, all the resources that they would need in order to develop any idea or project they're interested in. Very cool. 
you could park it outside of colleges and rent time in it. It's a good idea. Who's going to be brave and go next? We've got a lot of industrial design students in the back that are going to go, right? Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Home field advantage. Come on up. How's everybody doing? Um, I'm, uh, I'm Clayton. I'm an industrial design student here at Kendall. Uh, so our group is focusing on the issue of traveling in the airport alone. Um, it can be very inconvenient to keep all your stuff with you going through TSA. So we're looking to do a uh, soft goods uh, carry-on possible bag that could kind of tackle that issue. So it's still a little vague right now, but yeah. So some kind of a product that helps you manage your stuff better when you go to the airport. Excellent. How many people in here fly anywhere ever, right? It's a huge pain. So good problem to solve. There you go. Oh, we have a prop. This is a first. So you might be a little far along on this, but let's hear you out. How's it going? Uh, I'm Colin Reinders. I'm from Grand Haven, Michigan, and I go to Hope. Uh, I'm studying business, and this last summer in Grand Haven, Michigan, I launched Waveco, uh, working to solve some like the transportation issues in Grand Haven. So I grew up there like my whole life, like crazy traffic. We have Coast Guard, like crazy stuff. I just wanted something cool, something local, and I wanted to showcase like what I could do. So looking for some people, I got some new programs going. If anyone's interested, it'd be cool to chat about like your ideas and maybe do some stuff. Do, do they get to try the scooter? All right, is that allowed here? <laughs> all right. Okay, who's next? Come on, you gotta be warming up, thinking about all these good ideas. All right. Hi, I'm Lily, I'm from Aquinas. Um, I'm actually a biochemistry and molecular biology major. Um, and the problem that I want to solve is helping college students find off-campus housing because I know that a lot of, especially underclassmen, don't exactly know where to go with that. So my idea is a service with helping them like find leases and find out good ways to really just get out there and explore things that are off-campus. So. Definitely a need. Who's going to be next? Nobody wants to make eye contact with me. I know how that is. I'm a teacher. Industrial designers in the back. I'm going to keep coming back to you. Come on, Parker. Let's hear it. All right. Hello. My name is Parker, and I'm an industrial design student here at Kendall College. And we are working on a tool to help musicians get their musical inspiration ideas out quicker on the go. So we're looking for maybe a software developer and possibly a business student. So let me know. He forgot to ask. This is always great to engage the audience in the pitch. How many people are musicians in here? Look at that. So there's your relevant audience. Write your idea down right here. Who's next? Come on, be brave. Who's coming up here? We need at least 40 more. That means everyone's got to go twice. Come on. Who's coming up? Yeah, you guys can go. Yeah. I'm Josh Robinson, industrial design student here at Kindle. And we're working on a device that helps um, scrub techs in operating rooms clean their instruments faster to help save time. I'm not sure that one's relatable to anyone unless you've been in a surgery awake. Hopefully you haven't. So who else? Tim, you got anything to pitch the audience today? Camp Blue Sky? No? Industrial designers in the back. I know you guys got more ideas. Come on, Angelo. Bring it. 
Oh, you are? Oh, where are your other teams? Emily, I know you've got something to share. Come on. Come on, you got to do it. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, be brave. There you go. All right. Uh, how's it going, guys? Uh, my name is Jason Gross, and I'm a Cornerstone University student. I'm a dual major in business management and marketing. And right now, we're just looking for some feedback on our idea for how many of you guys wear mascara or girls mascara? A lot of you. Does it get clumpy and old? Well, we're trying to design a capsule to put around it that's battery powered that keeps it warm because the heat is going to keep it from getting clumpy. There you go. Excellent. Okay, anybody else? All right, so here's what we're going to do. See what time it is. So we've got about 15, 20 minutes. Um, if you didn't get up and pitch your idea, but you still want some feedback, because maybe you're shy, you know, it's okay. Um, you can still go over and write it down and put it up on the wall and get feedback from folks. So we'll give you a chance to kind of take a little bit of a break, grab some more food, something to drink, network, give people feedback on their ideas. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to pitch, but you still want feedback, grab a poster pad, write your idea down, put it up, and we'll help you out. So we'll be back in seats here in about 15 minutes or so. That's awesome. Keep talking to as many people as you can, right? One thing I know that most all good entrepreneurs have in common is you can't stop thinking about your idea and you just want to talk to everybody about it to the point where you may get some friends and family a little ticked off at you, but just keep talking about it. Keep talking about it, getting feedback. Ideas change over time. The more you talk about it, the better they become. So um, we're not going to deliver a full business education tonight, right? You guys have classes and stuff for that, but I want to talk about three things and have everybody walk away from here thinking about how am I going to do these three things? And we're going to buzz through some stuff here real fast. We only got about a half hour. So um, I'll stop for questions along the way and I'm going to go quick and we'll send this out and you can revisit this at your, at your, uh, at your leisure. So how many people here have put together a business model canvas before? Okay, so not everybody, so this won't be trivial. How many people here have done some level of validation around an idea where you've gone out and talked to people and got feedback, even fewer? And how many people have created a pitch deck? All right, well, this might be more relevant to everyone than I thought. All right, so we're gonna start about the business model. So you got an idea, how do you turn this idea into a well-rounded business model? And there's a difference, right? What you guys are pitching it's kind of the kernel, the core of an idea. But when I say, well, what's your business, right? There's a lot more involved in that. And we're going to talk about those things. But the first thing that everyone has to change in their mentality is you're not trying to coax money out of people, right? You're creating something of value and they're giving you something of value in return, money. So it's this concept of exchange. You're giving something that people really want, and they're giving you something you really want as a business. So think of it as like a partnership, a relationship between you and your customers in that way. So first things first, always start with the problem. So what's causing the problem? What's the real pain point? Who's heard the word pain point before? That's a great like design UX term, right? Awesome. So what's the pain point? What's causing it? How can you make it better? Can you, can you quantify it in some way? What does that new experience want to be, right? I'm saying a lot of things here, but I haven't given you any details yet about what the actual idea is. So you can define all of these things about your business without actually even knowing what you're giving them yet. So remember, it's not about the thing you're giving or creating, it's about the people. It's about what their lives are like, what you're doing to create some value in their lives. So this is the business model canvas. You guys can look this up. Uh, there's all kinds of free tools online through strategizer.com, I think. 
Um, but this is a really simple tool that you can use to kind of help develop and round out all the various aspects of, uh, of your business model. And we're gonna go through these uh, a little bit right now. So the right hand side of this canvas is about value creation. So these are all the things you need to do to create value for your customers and your business. So there's an order that you go through these and they sort of cascade one to the next to the next. So first things first, who's your customer, right? In some markets you have this payer buyer user thing. Who's familiar with this concept? If you have any marketing classes, hopefully you raise your hand, right? So the person who pays for a product might not be the person who uses the product or buys the product. A great example is if you're creating something for a kid, right? I'm working on a project for kids right now. Well, who buys it? Who buys that? Who makes the decision to buy it? Well, it's the parents, right? You got to design for them. You got to keep their needs in mind, but the kids are going to be the primary users. So that gets a little complicated, but identifying those folks, break the different types of customers you have down into segments. Are they the same? Are they different? And then try to define who your target or your prime prospect is. So these are going to be the first adopters, the people that are going to get the most value. Next thing is define your value proposition. So what problem are you solving? What are people actually willing to pay for? This is, a, this is a challenging thing for a lot of businesses. You create a really good idea, but are people actually willing to pay for it, right? You gotta get to that point where you can create exchange. What's unique, and the customer really defines that value, not you. You only learn that by listening to them and talking to them about your idea over and over again. Next is, how are you gonna make money at it? So how are you gonna make money? How are you gonna get the product in their hands and exchange that for money? Next, we have customer relationships. So this is really important. Um, you don't wanna depend on people just stumbling on your idea or your business, right? You wanna create that relationship. So how are you gonna to connect to them? How are you gonna get them to believe in what you have to offer? And that, that includes pre-acquisition as a customer, that includes during the purchase process, that also includes afterwards. How are you gonna keep those people? It's a lot cheaper to hang on to customers than it is to keep finding new ones every single time. Um, channels, these are all the things that you're gonna do to connect with them. So how are you gonna generate awareness? How are you gonna get them interested? And how are you gonna make the product available, right? So this could be something as simple as like, well, I'm going to run ads on Facebook or Instagram, right? You guys don't use Facebook. That's for old people. So I'm going to run ads on Instagram. And at first, I'm just going to build awareness about what the product is or about the problem, right? And then I'm going to buy a list of contact information. And I'm going to reach out to people in my prime market um, directly. And I'm going to say, hey, I know you have this problem. I want to solve this problem for you. And then I'm going to direct them back to my website. And that's where they're going to buy the product. Right? So I raise awareness, I pique their interest directly, and then I get them to uh, purchase the product. So one thing that you have to think about with your idea, everybody tends to kind of want to be the cheapest thing, and you're always worrying about how much things are going to cost. So think about the exchange concept again, and now place yourself on here somewhere. Not all solutions need to be inexpensive. Right? You have to kind of break away from that instinct of, well, if it's too expensive, people aren't going to buy it. Well, you don't know that, right? If you're creating enough value, they might buy that, right? They might really, you might be filling a real need for them. So there's this kind of continuum that you might fall in, and this probably makes sense, but, you know, cost-driven decisions, if your business is going to be really kind of a cost and efficiency thing, if you're going to take something that already exists and make it easier and make it quicker, more efficient to do or use or experience, you're probably driving a little more toward cost-based decisions, right? If you go up this curve and now you're introducing something that is just a little bit better quality than what's available on the market today, maybe you can charge a little bit more for that. Customer responsiveness is sort of that break line. So if this is a new thing that doesn't exist today and it's in response to a need that you keep seeing over and over again, that's the starting point where you can start charging a little bit more. How much do you charge for something that doesn't exist? That's a tough thing to figure out. It's one of the hardest things to figure out. If you're really pushing up this curve into things that like products that are based on craftsmanship or high brand or luxury. So where do you think Apple plays in here? 
way up on that part of the curve, right? If they introduce something totally innovative that's never been seen before, they start even further up on that curve toward the innovation side, and eventually you see their pricing come down, but you pay a premium for that brand. So think about that. Don't always default to being the cheapest solution out there. Unless it's based on efficiency and cost savings in some way, don't start the thinking that way. You can never raise your prices. You can only bring them back down, right? So don't default to cost position at first. Okay, so the other side of the, the, um, the chart here is about cost creation. So these are all the things that are gonna cost you to run your business. So if you're gonna execute this business idea, these are things that generate cost. Um, and again, moving kind of quickly here, so key resources. So what are you gonna need to run this business? These could be different types of disciplines you've gotta hire, these could be processes or procedures you have to pay for. You gotta think if these are internal to the business or if you're gonna have to outsource them. Um, what kind of activities do you need to execute to get the business going or keep it going? And then are there partners that you're gonna rely on for your business? So these could be key suppliers. If you're doing something that requires like a unique kind of material or purchase component, you're gonna to wanna to have a pretty good relationship with that company so you can stay in business. Experts, collaborators, if there may be a joint venture of some type. And then the last is cost, right? So really three things you wanna think about. What's it gonna cost me to make the product or deliver the service? And then what's it gonna cost me to start the business and what's it gonna cost me to continue to run operations? So operations are things like I pay rent somewhere, I gotta pay salaries. These are costs that you're gonna incur just to run the business versus direct costs related to what your actual product uh, or service is. So this is meant to be a living document. When we do these exercises in class, you take a bunch of sticky notes out, you, you try to fill in what you think you know and, and create some hypotheses and fill it up and then you step back and you say, all right, this kind of makes sense, right? If I've got a resource here I think I have to pay for, well then I need to put that cost down here, right? If I think over here I'm gonna do some type of a retail channel, when I talk about my revenue stream, I gotta make sure I know what my retail price is and then I gotta know what my price is to sell to the retailers, right? So all the pieces need to kind of link up and you do it for the first time. If it doesn't make sense, you start moving things around and you start changing things until it does make sense. So this is always how you wanna start this kind of an exercise. We do what's called the no wonder exercise, right? So start by listing out the things that you know, and these can be things like, hey, these are solutions people are buying today. These are available on the market. Here's what's great about them. Uh, maybe you found some stats. So I've got five million people that experienced this problem last year. Maybe you know how much the market's worth. People spent X amount of dollars on something. And then you make a list of things that you still wonder about. And these are things that you don't have the answers to, right? Things like, well, do the people actually like what they're buying today? Is it fulfilling that need? Um, where do they get the stuff from? Which are the best products or services available? Things like that. And then you go out and you find answers to these questions. And when you do, they go over there and you keep filling the list. Developing a business model is really just the exercise of figuring out what you need to learn, learning that information, going back and changing the model based on that, and then asking more questions. And this happens over and over and over again. So it's really a living document. And, and be creative, right? So there's a straightforward path with a lot of these concepts. It's an app. I'm gonna create this app and then I'm gonna get as many people to sign up for it and pay for it as possible. That's a pretty straightforward business model, right? Well, I wanna show you one, one example here that hopefully gets you thinking outside the box. Who's seen this before? 10 types of innovation, you should Google this, there's books about it. Um, what this chart basically does is it lays out kind of a continuum of all the different ways that you can innovate a business. So when you look at this, these things have to do with the way your business is structured. You can be really innovative about the way your business is structured. These things are about the actual system or the product that you're offering or the service, and these things are a little bit more experience-based, things that the consumer experiences. So you can think of this as like back, backstage, front stage kind of thing, but when you look at this, 
the actual product or service that you're creating is only the smallest part of it. There's so many other things you can do to innovate and create value in your business. So let's take a look at a quick example here. Who's seen this before? Tinkercrate, right? I'm a parent, I've got young kids, so I get these kind of ads, right, all the time. So Tinkercrate is a service. It's a product. It's an educational experience. It's a thing that shows up at your door once a month for your kid to learn STEM, to learn how to be creative, to put their hands on stuff, right? So there are all kinds of STEM-based products out there on the market, and a lot of them are great, right? There's some coding things, some gaming things. If you remember this long ago or you have younger siblings, um, how many times does a person or a kid actually play with something before they get sick of it? like a couple, right? They rotate through things, they lose interest. So why spend a lot of money developing a product that's only gonna get used a handful of times, right? So this is what these guys did. They came up with a, a service, it's a box service, it shows up at your door once a month and each month there's a different kit in there and it teaches you different principles, different STEM principles. And the kids actually have to put the thing together, they have to figure out how to make it and then they run little experiments with it to learn how it works and they can tweak it and modify it and they learn basic principles about science and math and creating. So if I were to put this product together in a factory somewhere, does it cost me more money to do that or to laser cut all these little parts out and throw them in a box and not put anything together? It cost me more money to put it together myself, right? So not only did they solve a problem of keeping fresh content in front of kids, they actually innovated their business by just rethinking the way they make things in general, rethinking what the actual product is itself. So. You get these kits. Um, so their value proposition, a lot of websites will do this. It's right there, right? They're saying a laboratory for hands-on experiments delivered every month. That's what they do. That's how they create value. And also, you got two target audiences right here, right? Get it or gift it. So who's this person? Who's this for? A parent, who's this for? Grandparent maybe, right? That's probably a little hanging fruit. So right out of the gate, there's a couple different paths depending on who you are, but you know right away, and they're supporting it with some great imagery that kind of shows what you get, right? So th they're doing a really good job of selling already. Even more so, they're breaking down their target audience a little bit more. They realize that kids here and kids here need to be challenged in different ways. So. What isn't quite as obvious, unless you're paying attention to this stuff like I do, is this all didn't exist when they first started, right? They started here. Or maybe it was here, one of these two, right? And they started creating these offerings and they said, hey, these parents, they've got other kids, other ages, right? So what if we create something that was more for this developmental age group? And how about something for this right here? Now all of a sudden, that is relationship building with parents. That is building on customer acquisition and keeping people over time. So I might have it for my kid here, and if they really like it as they get older, I can just get them a different kit. It's a really smart thing to do as a business. Um, they also give you options on how to buy. So I'm a little bit unsure, I, I don't know, I wanna buy just, just one just to try it out and see if my kid likes it or whatever. And then maybe you step up into something like this and you can see you get discounts for the more that you buy, right? So they give people a lot of options, but what are they really selling here? The same thing, right? Every month they make a whole bunch of kits and the same kit goes out to the person who bought that, 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 that. It's a really efficient way to do the business. Um, so as far as building customer relationships, things like, hey, look at these kids. They look pretty happy, right? If I have kids like that, I want my kids to be that happy. I see that kind of imagery. I think, hey, I can identify with this brand. I can identify with what they're doing. And I think this relates to me in my life in some way, right? So there's a connection there. Um, things like testimonials, it's important. 
and those things translate to social media. So this is how they're building awareness. This is how they're building trust in their brand. If other parents do this and their kids like it, I'm gonna do it and my kids are gonna like it. So a lot of this stuff is kind of marketing 101, but just think of how this permeates the whole business model here. So in a nutshell, that's what we want you to do is think around all those different dimensions of your idea and start thinking about it as a business and not just a thing or a service or a basic idea. Any questions before we move? We're good? Is this new to anybody? Is this interesting, hopefully? Hopefully not everybody's seen this every, every class. Um, okay, so once you have that, once you have that basic business model, the next thing is thinking about uh, validating that. So you might have a good idea, but how do you know if you have the right idea for the right customer? So we never just create this theory about a business. We always want to test it and make sure we're on the right track. Um, so these are the questions you want to start with, right? Ask yourself, who's your target audience? What do I need to learn from them? Where and how should I engage them to learn this information? How am I going to communicate the idea? And then how am I going to document the feedback? And then go out and start talking to people. So let's talk about communicating your idea real quick. So I'm a designer by background, so some of this stuff I see all the time, some of it maybe, maybe isn't as uh, relevant to you guys, but visualize the experience in some way. People are visual learners. Think about how you can communicate what somebody is going to experience when they use the product or service without actually having to create it. That's the trick, right? So what are they going to experience? If it's a process, first you do this, then this, then this. You can illustrate that. What are the benefits? How does it work? So it could be an interesting storyboard like this, and these are really, really cool illustrations. If you can do this kind of stuff, great. If you know someone who can, that's a valuable person to have on your team. But it also could be something as simple like this, right? How many people here think they could draw something like this? It, it may not seem highly polished, but I'm telling you, when you get in, in front of somebody and have a conversation, even something at this level really makes a difference. It could be things really simple like this, where you're trying to call attention to the key benefit or the value that you're creating. I just found these online. I have no idea what these products are, but these are really simple illustrations, right? You get the point. You're telling a story, you're showing this to somebody, and with a few words and a couple basic illustrations, they kind of get your point, right? If you have a background, like what some of us do here as designers, more detailed illustrations, more detailed visualizations, less talking, more intuitive response to what they're seeing. But this is before anything has been designed. This is before anyone spent any money on anything. And it isn't just for sketching either. It can also be a like a low fidelity prototype or a mock-up of some point, of some type, right? You can create things out of found objects around the house, cardboard, paper, foam board, whatever, anything you can put in somebody's hand to help them understand um, what you're trying to get, a, get accomplished with the idea is a big benefit and let them try it, right? So this is an example of uh, something that I did traveling and this guy was thinking about a kind of an innovative way to water um, his garden. Right, so he's got some pot bottles and different things. They have issues with water preservation or water uh, collection. And these are bottles that he found in the trash with a couple really basic irrigation um, bits and pieces he found at the hardware store. Right, It didn't take much for him to get the idea and test it out. Um, if you've got some graphic skills, you can create what looks to be a functional app, but all it is is an image doesn't really do anything. But when I look at it as a user, I kind of get it. Like I kind of understand what's going on with it. You can also do it in a low fidelity way like this, right? When they prototype and they go through user experience design workshops, this is a common thing. You've got a little template that looks like a phone and you stick one piece of paper behind it and you say, all right, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this. It doesn't take an awesome artist or a designer to test ideas at this level. That's the point I want to get across. It doesn't matter how good you are at drawing or making things, anything helps. Doing anything helps to demonstrate the point. Once you have that, 
get out and talk to people, build relationships, share your ideas, get more feedback. So this is important. These are the things that you should try to learn and in this order, right? So when you talk to somebody, find out if they have the problem you're trying to solve. Are they in your target audience or not? If they do, do they like what you have? Are they willing to pay for what you have? If so, how much? Is it unique versus the competition? And can they think of ways to make it better? So the conversation could be just these five questions. How do you find people? Well, search your friends list, go on social networks, email people, referrals, any and every which way that you can. You gotta get creative. Just find a way to connect. So it doesn't need to be complicated to start. And I'm gonna share an example here, and the owner uh, and entrepreneur behind this idea is actually in the audience, so hopefully I do him justice here, but um, how many people have seen this before? Hip shot dot, right? There you go, Tim, there's a whole new audience for you. Um, so this is a product, it's a site product that goes on your, on your uh, display screen for gaming, first person shooter games. I'm not a gamer, but I get it, right? It's simple enough. Um, so when Tim came up with this idea, his goal was, I believe, to help the, the player understand where the site was gonna shoot without having to go into this mode, right? Um, and toggle back and forth between a zoomed in and a zoomed out mode. So he wants to know where this spot is on the screen every single time. So when something runs in front of it, he can shoot it. I don't know if this was yours or not, or if I just found this, but you can see some people have tried things. And this is really uh, just a magnifying glass taped to a TV screen. I do not advise this, but someone's trying to solve the problem. You can't get, get much more low fidelity than something like that. Well, Tim kind of took it to the next level. He took a mouse, he ripped the mouse off, took the cord, put a suction cup with a little LED light in it. Pretty simple, right? And then he stuck it to a TV and he had a whole bunch of people try it. And what did you learn when you did this? And when people played this and when they saw it for the first time, did, it, did the light bulb kind of go on? Like, hey, this is, people get it. It's easy to use, right? You can, you can have a theory about that, but until you actually try something and you get people to experience it and give you feedback, you just never know. You gotta get outside yourself as a user and find out if there's really something there. So after he went through this process, um, he had enough confidence to move forward and made a real product. And he's been selling all over the place online. It's been in a number of different stores, but all of that success over the course of what, two years at least, maybe longer? Okay. Um, but it all started with him having a problem, observing what was going on, finding a way to mock it up in a super low fidelity way, and figuring out if he actually had something there. So help visualize, mock up, anything you can to help people understand what it's gonna be like to experience the product, service, or whatever you're creating. That's the bottom line. And then go out and talk to them. Any questions on that? Any questions for Tim about his product? Okay, you can find them afterwards if you do. Okay, so lastly, we kind of have the pitch here. So you know you got a good idea, you validated it, you feel good about it. How are you gonna sell people on the idea? So ideally, these three things are what you're gonna do between now and the competition for MWest. That's why I'm kind of rolling this out for you here. So how are you gonna convince people that you have a good idea, they should give you the money, um, they should support whatever you're doing? Oops. Um, so typical presentations kind of push information at people, right? Kind of like what I'm doing right now. Some of you look like you want me to stop talking and I will soon, but I'm pushing information at you because I want you to have it. <clears throat> when it comes to talking about your idea, you're creating a story, right? And stories kind of pull people in. You want to connect to the audience, help them understand why should I care about what this person is telling me? How is it relevant to me? What's the impact gonna be, right? So think of it that way. You're kind of telling them a story and there's, a, there's usually an arc to a story. You don't start by telling people what happens at the end. You start by building up, right? I think it's called the hero's journey. There's actually a, a formula that you go through to tell a good story to engage an audience. This is no different. Oops, stupid PC. All right, so 
Start with why. That's the first thing you want to do. Why should the audience ask yourself this? Why should they care about what you're trying to sell them? How is it relevant to them? If you can visualize the scenario, the experience, the problem, what have you, if you can quantify the problem, right? If I tell you, you know, people get the flu in Grand Rapids. How much do you care about that? If I told you that last year, 50,000 elderly people got the flu in Grand Rapids and 25% of them died from it. Totally fabricated numbers. But you care all of a sudden, right? Holy cow, that's a big problem. Even if you didn't get the flu, you do care now, right? So creating empathy for the people that experience the problem, be visual, demonstrate. Um, put the audience in the place where the problem and the solution happen, right? That's your goal. So. Let's look at an example here. I'm gonna design something for uh, bicycle commuters. Downtown Grand Rapids, there's a lot of them around here. You know, this guy he rides to work in traffic every day. Uh, he's got minimal safety equipment, kind of worries about vehicle drivers a little bit. Do they see him or not? He has a hard time finding parking when he gets there and limited storage capacity. How many people here ride a bike to work every day? Nobody, right? So I look at this, can you, these are, you kind of get it, right? You believe me that this person exists and, and they might have these problems and think about these things and, and I could leave it there, right? Or I could do this with subtle changes. All right, so now here's my person. Look, he's on a bike, right? I see a picture like this. I understand this person a little bit better. When I say he's not wearing safety equipment, it's like, sh this guy has a helmet on and nothing else. If he fell off his bike in traffic, he's done. He's toast, right? So same basic comments along the left side, but just by changing the picture and putting the audience in the place where the problem happens. And then I can even go further and I could show you. If you've never been hit by a car with a bike, if I told you it hurts, and then I show you an image like this, don't you kind of immediately think like, first of all, holy crap, if I was this person in this car and I saw this and I hit this person, that would be awful. Secondly, you probably empathize with this guy a little bit, that would really suck to get hit by a car. Just with one image, right? And I found this on Google. You may have your own images that you find through your research. And then I say, hey, I get to work and there's nowhere to park my bike. If I tell you that first, Without any images, you think I'm complaining. If I say, but look, you go, okay, yeah, this is a problem, right? This is a real problem this person has. If I say I don't have any way to carry stuff on my bike, and then you see something like this, it helps you connect to the problem. It's part of the story. So the more imagery, the better. Put people in the place where it happens. So which version of that story stuck with you? Obviously the second one, right? Make sure you drive careful and watch for uh, bicyclists on the road when you leave here tonight. So the goals for your pitch, help people understand why they need it, use real visual evidence, demonstrate the experience of using the idea, prove to people that others are gonna love it and pay for it, um, try to show that opportunity with numbers and convince them it's desirable, feasible, and viable. Okay, who's seen this before? Man, oh man, I assumed everyone's gonna raise their hand. Okay, this came from IDO and their Human Centered Design Toolkit. And what they say is, uh, the best idea to know if you've got something worth pursuing is sort of an overlap of all three of these ideals. Is it desirable? Do people want it? Is it feasible? Can you make it? Can you deliver it as a business? Is it viable? Does it make financial sense, right? So finding a balance of these things, kind of think about your pitch addressing each one of these things. And so how do we address this? Well, oops, my bad. Click, click, what the? So how do you prove if something's desirable? Feedback, right? People said, I love that thing. I would totally buy that. How do you prove it's feasible? Well, you're not gonna make and manufacture the product in the next month and a half. If you can, I wanna talk to you because that's amazing. But 
I can look at similar products, right? If you've got a piece of electronic equipment and it uses the same basic guts as something else that already functions, you can go, hey, look, this exists. I'm just gonna use this technology for something else. And immediately you kind of convince the audience, oh, well, this can be done, right? It's, it's one more box they can check. Is it viable? Can it become a viable business? Well, I run a few numbers. Can I show a profit? Is there a big enough market where this could grow potentially? Um, and can I protect the idea somehow? So maybe like a basic patent search, something like that. It's unique compared to the competition. So all of these things we already talked about doing help tell this story. And you don't need to say desirable, feasible, viable. Just include these pieces of evidence in your pitch and mentally you will check those boxes. So how do we tell the story? What does that flow looks like? So I like to split a pitch really into two halves. The first half is about explaining to people what, is, what it is, right? So you talk about your team, you talk about the problem you're solving, you talk about the solution, competition for, for the, the market, and you kind of hit them with the value proposition. This is why mine's valuable and why it's different. The second half is really focused on will it work? Will it work as a business? So what's the target market? How many of them are there, right? Is it at a scale? Is there a first market, a second market that you can grow into? How are you gonna make money at doing this? And how are you gonna be able to deliver the product? Did you validate it? Do we know that people are gonna wanna buy it? And lastly, this is kind of a conclusion slide, um, never leave a pitch deck on something that says, thank you very much for your time. Leave them with a picture of, or something that you have to offer and your value proposition. So when you take questions, they're staring at the thing that you're trying to sell them. So if you look at this as a story, we've got these basic sections, and this is the story that it tells. So here's who we are as a team. This is what's wrong and how I'm gonna fix it, right? These are all the different solutions out there today that don't work. This is why mine's better, right? This is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm offering that people are willing to pay for. Who am I benefiting the most? Who's gonna be the first adopter of my product? How many of them are there? How am I gonna sell them? How am I gonna make money? How am I gonna deliver the product or service? Uh, what do people think about it? Are they willing to receive what I'm trying to deliver? Right? So I know I have a good idea. And then lastly, remember my idea. So that is the basic breakdown to a pitch. There's a lot of different ways to do it. This is one simple approach. It checks a lot of boxes. It works. If you break down a lot of different pitch, pitch decks, they all sort of include these things. Um, the order of this seems to work really well in building momentum toward the final thing, saying, boom, and I know people are going to want it. And this is the evidence I have for that. So any questions on this? OK, how are we doing on time? So. Um, the last thing we kind of have for you guys this evening, and I think we're doing good on time, uh, we have the first place winners from the MWS Challenge last year. So we thought might, what might be good for you guys is to see what the judges consider to be a pretty good pitch, a pretty good idea. Um, and so this is your opportunity to listen to somebody pitch and kind of envision what's it going to take for yourself to get to that point with your idea. Okay, any questions before we do that? So I'm gonna introduce Aiden Wysocki. Do you want your TCU pitch or your MWS? Okay. Good to see you again. You too. So Aiden, Aiden and his team uh, came up with an idea and worked it through over the course of the last year. And they were accepted and competed in actually the nation's largest collegiate business plan competition in, at Texas Christian University. And they also competed and won in the MWest Challenge last year. So this idea, I think Aiden worked on for about a year, including the second half of that year being um, as an entrepreneur in an entrepreneurship class. And uh, he's going to kind of take you through his pitch here. And you guys can ask him questions when you're done. But this will give you a good idea of what, what uh, a, good, a good pitch looks like. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, my name is Aiden Wysocki. Uh, not with me is um, Matt Veenhoven and Jake Dabkowski. Um, 
They, uh, they were with me um, at the very start of the MOS competition and uh, right when we registered as a team and uh, kind of built our, our pitch deck uh, from the ground up. Um, our product idea is MedRover. It's a medical communication device uh, and uh, emergency communication device for summer camps. Um, Jake and I uh, were friends for a long time at a summer, uh, summer camp that we grew up at in Nuego uh, called Camp Henry. And um, yeah, this is, uh, the, this is what we love. This is what we do, and it, it's our passion. It's um, kind of what we, we saw growing up and, and what we continue to do in college is uh, be counselors. And for five summers, I was a camp counselor at uh, Camp Henry with Jake. And um, we, we connected with kids and the, the nurses and the, uh, the administrators and all the other counselors there and learned kind of what that life was like and their problems. Uh, that they face, but we, we believe that camp is a great place for kids uh, who are growing up that want to challenge themselves and kind of learn their identities and their own personalities and challenge the world that they live in. Uh, in 2017, there was a survey uh, which con conducted with uh, 300 summer camps. They found that 19% of U.S. kids take medication, and 71% of the camps uh, were reporting. 71% of camps in the U.S. reported having um, kids bring medications to camp. But 45% of them also said that they had trouble managing their camper medications. Uh, when, when I started, I conducted 24 interviews. And, um, and throughout the process, we, we conducted many more uh, with camp administrators, um, camp counselors, uh, nurses. And some of the things they said were uh, 20 years ago, it used to be just a single tub of medications, when now it's somewhere around two wagons full each week. And lines for medications can get as long as 30 to 40 minutes. And this is right outside the health center where you can see the lines getting longer and longer. But each camper takes about 50 to 60 seconds, which means that the entire camp process or the camp medication process uh, can be pretty cumbersome for the last kids in line. Um, you know, with 50 campers at breakfast, three or four at lunch, 20 at dinner, and 25 at night, uh, we wanted to focus on the breakfast side of this because this is where they really experienced a problem where when I was a counselor, I would be wondering where little Levi was, but he, he was like showing up 10 minutes at, till, like, t at 10 minutes before the end of the breakfast period. And it's because he was at the end of the line there, still waiting for his meds uh, whenever I'd go to find him. Uh, and then, you know, the last 10 campers in line are waiting uh, more than 33 minutes. And when we talked to some of the campers, these are actually uh, John's uh, very own children. And uh, when we asked him, he said that the line was going to take forever. So he just kind of felt like he didn't need to take it. And, you know, it, it also felt kind of uh, stigmatizing to take medications in front of um, all the other campers and everyone, uh, which meant that, you know, it kind of was a positive thing to wait till the end of the line until it was time to eat your breakfast and you only had five or ten minutes. Uh, so what we propose is uh, MedRover. It's a communication wristband for counselors. Uh, we start with software, which uh, is run by the camp nurse and broadcast on the broadcast hub to a counselor wristband. And from the wristband, uh, the counselor is able to see which camper is called, um, what time the camper needs their medications, and at which meal period they should send them, and whether they've been sent or not, which is all tracked on the Med uh, MedRover software. So uh, in the software uh, kind of interface here, you can see that there's a spot you can click on the counselors and find um, which counselor has, has sent their campers and which ones have not. Uh, the green indicates they have. And then there's different tabs for morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, yellow means that they're in waiting. So once the camper's been sent, uh, they'll be sent uh, to the health center. They're checked off by the nurse as the medications are um, administered. And the next campers are called. Uh, so the nurse hub is uh, something that sends out the radio frequency. This is something we're working with the family broadcasting uh, service, which is about 462 wavelength. And um, it goes about 20 to 25 to 30 miles, um, which works for most summer camps in the US. And um, that reaches the devices, uh, which are the MedRover Council wristbands. We wanted to show you what we think is possible given the right amount of, uh, right amount of time and effort. So hopefully that's one good example. Uh, there are others posted on the website. So if you guys go to mwestchallenge.com, 
the, re the registration is officially open, but there's also tons of information here. So a couple things I wanna leave you with. You can sign up to compete, but you don't need to submit your executive summary until March 6th. You have a month to get that together. You can also wait and sign up to compete when you submit your executive summary. Just do it by 11.59 p.m. on March 6th, okay? The next question that I always get is, well, I've got a team of four. Does everyone have to sign up? No. One team captain signs up, and then they can list all the other members of your team in one registration. So we make it nice and easy. Um, trying to think, any other questions about the competition or the sign up? There's a couple guidelines on the website. There's a, a tab that says um, information under that is executive summary. It's got every single section I talked about. All you have to do is answer the questions in there and you're good to go. That's a good starting point. So if there aren't any further questions, I wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. Hopefully you consider um, signing up for the competition this year.